Praise God. <laughs> How many is thankful tonight that God's been good to you this week? Amen. That God's been good to you this week. Amen. No matter what you're going through or no matter what you're dealing with, God has been good to you. Amen. If you've got a roof over your head and food on your table, God's been good to you. Amen. Amen. And uh, tonight I'm just going to, I want to do a, a revisit of something I've taught in the past. And uh, I, I, this is not, I spent several weeks teaching on this, but tonight I'm just going to simply uh, talk about it again. And you know that the Bible teaches us uh, in 1 Peter 2 and 17, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. If there's something missing in our society today, and this is probably one of the first things I taught about when I came here, but respect is really missing from this day and age. Respect for one another. Respect for authority. And, you know, Peter starts out by saying, honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Respect God. Honor the king. Exodus 20 and 12, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Amen. So there again is an honor. Respect the Lord. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Amen. You know, that, that is a principle that applies to everyone. I have individuals, and, and I'm thankful for them. I wish they were sitting on pews, but there are individuals that, that will send their tithes uh, with family members to church. Now, they haven't come to church, and they may not be living right, but, but they understand that principle. I'm going to honor the Lord with my substance. And with the first fruits of all of mine increase. And they understand that, you know, what happens is, is, is when I'm faithful to giving God. See, people love to be faithful to giving to God when they understand the principle that if I give to God, he will not let me be in debt to him. Now, don't, don't, get, don't get worried. I'm not going to preach on tithing or giving. One thing I love about Peace Tabernacle, through the years, somebody has taught this church about giving. This is a very faithful church. It's a very giving church. And I will stand before you and tell you I'm a grateful pastor. I don't feel a need to have to talk about it all the time. Because you folks believe in that concept. And so, it's a good thing to give unto the Lord. It's a good thing to pay your tithes. Amen. You know... Uh, one man, you know, he, he was faithful in giving and, and the Lord blessed him with a, with a new job, making a lot more money and all of a sudden his tithing became scarce. You know, he didn't pay his tithes as faithful. And so the pastor called him. He was a leading leadership. The pastor said, hey, brother, what's going on with your tithing? You used to be real faithful and uh, now, you know, you're kind of hit and miss. And he said, well, pastor, every time I get to looking at the size of that check, I'm writing you. And that's the first, don't, you're not writing it to Brother Baumgartner. I, I tell you, that I, not one check that is paid to tithing has my name on it. It says Peace Tabernacle. Now, if you want to write me a check, I'll let you. Just put on their gift, and, and I, I'll promise you, I know how to spend it. But no, you pay it as unto the Lord, you know. And we, we take a record of that and keep an account of that. And, and, uh, and Brother Bumgarner does pay himself out of that. And, uh, you know, I try to have a payday every once in a while and to be able to take care of my family. And I'm thankful for that. But you, you, you give your first fruits unto the Lord. And, and so this man, you know, the pastor just told him, he said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll just pray God give you your old job back. Because you were faithful with your old job. Oh, no, Pastor. Oh, no. 
<laughs> Had a little bit different sound to it. You know, the thing is this. When you think about it, if you're able to write a $500 tithes check, thank God. That meant you just made $5,000. That's the way I always looked at it, you know. And so uh, if you're able to, to, to write that, write it unto the Lord. Because you, you're the only person, and, and, and it's, it's not so much, I can't, I, you know, I honestly don't feel that somebody may go to hell over it. But I do feel like you miss out. You miss out on the blessings of God. Verse 10 says, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. That means, to me, you know, your cupboards are going to be full. Your bills are going to be paid. And thy presses shall burst out with new, new wine. That's where the scripture comes, given it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together, flowing. I wasn't even going to teach on this tonight, but that just kind of come out. And so, amen. Y'all got that for just good measure. Amen. But you know, it's true. And when you, when you're, when you give, you respect what you make. I guess I'm going to teach on this because I'm feeling it in the spirit. Most people don't respect what they make. In fact, one preacher said it like this. God's not worried about the 10% that you give to the, to the church or the offering. You know, some churches teach give 10% and 5% tithe, uh, offering and 10% tithes. And, and a lot of times I apply that in my own life, you know, because the offering's above and beyond what God requires. And so I want to be blessed, and so I give a little extra. Amen. But, but uh, you know, t too many times it's the 90% that we don't manage correctly. God knows where the 10% is going. But it's the 90%. You know, one man said this, you know, when, when he teaches his church, Brother Lewis, in fact, he says, you know, he tells the church, he says, you know, first thing is pay your tithes. Pay God. You can't pay God. He owns it all anyway. But pay your tithes. Pay your bills. Pay yourself. But a lot of people get that twisted. Pay myself. Pay what bills I can. And if there's any left over. Hello. Then, then I'll pay God. <laughs> but you see when we get things twisted. Then things are always twisted. And in this day and age. If you will respect what you make. You will understand that the job that you have comes from the Lord. Praise God. The Lord blessed you with that job. Don't grumble about it. Don't complain about it. You know, that's part of the, our problem in this generation. We don't respect where we're at. We're not content where we're at. So we feel like we ought to be somewhere else. We should be the boss or, or, or we should be making more money. I'm not against anybody bettering themselves i'm not against anybody having nice things i'm not but at the same time the bible teaches us whatever state you find yourself to be in be content in that place and i guess that's the principle i learned in the home my father amen worked for zachary for many many years and and made a good living Made a good living back in the early 80s. I mean, we went on good vacations back then. We went to Disneyland, San Diego Zoo. You know, we went on good family vacations. Load up the van, put the 8-track in. I was just going to see if I catch any, you know, the Hensons, you know, 8-track Hensons. None of y'all know what I'm talking about. And uh, down the road we'd go. And I remember... Uh, <laughs> They offered to move dad to Texas, and he said, no, I don't think I'll go. <laughs> and uh, he wanted to stay close to his mom and dad. And so there was a major transformation in our family. We went from uh, making a very good living to, to him being self-employed and then trying that, and then he went to work for the school district. And it was about 50% less than what he was making for Zachary. So trips to Disneyland didn't come as often or didn't come at all for many, many years. And... Uh, 
we we had a we had a time in my family where we had to learn how to trust excuse me trust God, and so he started out driving a bus, being a janitor, and he ne he told me, son, I never asked for a raise. Now the whole time he's working on the side, he's doing construction projects, he's trying to take care of his family. Because one thing he preached to me more than anything else, if a man doesn't take care of his family, he's worse than an infidel. And that was something he drove home, son. You know, and so long days and long hours. But uh, he, he, he never tried to make, tell somebody he deserved more than what he was getting. He said, son, I'll work hard, and when they feel like I'm worthy of more, they'll give me more. And he went back to the scripture about I respect who I work for. I respect who I am. And when God wills it, I'm going to make more money. Well, praise God. And so when you find yourself, when you respect what you do, you don't complain about it. That's the, part of the problem with a lot of folks is, is, you know, they get discontented. They get discontented in marriages. They get discontented on the job. That's where disrespect starts happening. And so when you respect what you do and you honor what you have, amen, you're not as quick. Let me just say it like this, going back to finances, you're not as quick to, uh, uh, you know, be fruitless with your finances. You know, my dad used to pick at me all the time. I'd get paid from doing a job with him and he's, and as soon as I got paid, I was ready to get off. And he used this term, boy, it's burning a hole in your pocket, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes I felt money was like water. It just flowed in and flowed right out. But God cares about how, what kind of stewards we are. I believe you ought to respect what God blesses you with. Respect your house. Amen. Amen. Respect your automobiles. Respect those things that God gives you. You know, when we have respect for something, we hold it, we hold it in esteem. Or almost reverence. But oftentimes, our respect is not respect. Our respect is tolerance. Because tolerance doesn't imply any positive feelings. Now, I can tolerate you, but that doesn't mean I have to respect you. Because if I have respect for you, I, I've got warm fuzzies. There's something I admire about you. But if I just tolerate you, Come on now. If I just tolerate you, then there's nothing about you that I like. In fact, the anonym or the opposite of a respect is contempt. But you know what we have to do? We need to try to find something about each individual, especially in this church, Amen. That we can admire so that we can respect them. Oh, I wish the whole church was here. <laughs> we have to do more than just tolerate each other. You know, that's what siblings do on road trips. You're on my side of the car. Mom, John put his toe on my side of the car. You know, in my, in my truck, I have a car seat over here for Jonathan and a car seat over here for Jordan. And I have a charge station right in the middle. A barrier. Something that separates them. And no, even though I've done all of those things, they still fight. That's, to that's tolerating. Yeah. So... Respect is a platform 
that all great relationships are built. And it doesn't matter what that relationship is. The relationship with your employer has to be built on respect. The relationship with your finances huh, has to be built with respect. Your relationship with one another should be built on respect. And above all, your relationship with the Lord ought to be built up on respect. You know who we disrespect more than anybody else in this world? When we do things our own ways, when we take matters into our own hands, we disrespect Him. Ephesians 5 and 21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Amen. So when we look at respect, we have to understand that there's respect for mankind. There's respect for the brotherhood, the church. There is reverence for God. The beginning of all wisdom is what? Anybody? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And that's not talking about being afraid of God it's reverencing God as a child does their father now I'm not uh, I'm, I'm pleased ladies don't think that I'm I'm being crude or, or disrespectful to you that's not my intentions most of you will probably agree with me because I don't know why it is but children with their mothers can push them push them push them push them my wife will threaten them with switches my wife will uh, threaten them with all kinds of stuff. And uh, I'll come home and she'll be like, oh, they've just run me ragged today. I just... Now, when they're with me, I don't have those problems. And I try to make it my bark is worse than my bite. That's, that's the truth. But, you know, it's, it's like my wife says, her dad get that certain tone in his voice. You know, they'll be fighting, and I'll be like, go to your room. I mean, whatever they're doing stops, and, you know, it's, I got the fear factor on them. I've got that edge. That, I don't know it's the daddy edge, you know. And uh, my older children said, you know, I've just got anger management problems. And, uh, see, they experienced me at a much younger age, so I may have had them back then, but I've mellowed with age. But, you know, that's the thing. There's got to be that respect. Now, they aren't afraid of me as far as being fearful. They love their daddy. When they're hurting, they want daddy to hold them. When they, when they you, know, are in, you know, in times of protection, they know daddy will protect me. And so, so it's not a, a fear of, of that I'm, I'm, a, I'm afraid of him. That when he walks in the room, I cringe and I'm afraid. And, and that's not the way we are with God either, is it? We know he's not that way. We don't cringe because of what he can do to us. Now, he has the power and the ability. And children probably know that too. Daddy has the ability to put a whooping on us. And it hurt. But there's also that other side of daddy that they know. The loving side, the gentle side, the protective side. And so, very much so is that same relationship with the Lord. However, when we take it and put him in contempt and no longer respect him for who he is, then we do whatever we want to do. And, you know, the church is a theocracy. It's not a democracy. It's a theocracy. God is in control. And so God puts a man, amen, a pastor. God gives us pastors, right, to lead us and guide us. And I pray that, you know, you'll study your word. And if I'm ever not in the book, then don't follow me. But if I'm in the book, then you should heed what the pastor says. Amen? Oftentimes, pastor will say, we don't need to do this, or we don't need to do that. And he sets out guidelines. And, 
And, you know, we live in a day and age that is constantly trying to tear down barriers that were built by the past, both in the church and in society. And guardrails, amen, they're, they're put there for a reason. Now, if you've ever been on a high mountain, that's why I don't ever want to live in California, Sister Sawyer. Because I know them people ain't got sense, because you, you're up on a mountain pass or a mount, on a high mountain, and it's 5,000 feet to the bottom, and they don't have a guardrail. Now, if that was in Texas, we'd probably have a fence. Because we're smarter in Texas. We build guardrails. We build guardrails when there's just a little two-foot ditch. Because we understand that somebody go off in that ditch get hurt. We're going to put up a guardrail. It's going to protect them. Amen. We put up a jersey barrier. I found out what a jersey barrier was when Sister Bumgarner, amen, rear-ended the lady on Beltway 8 that took out that concrete barrier. That's called a jersey barrier. And I, got, I figure the people from New Jersey need that kind of stuff, you know. And, uh, but you know what? We make sure that the other person can't hurt us. We keep ourselves protected. Sometimes you put up fences, amen, not to keep somebody out. But to keep what you in. And so you have to respect, amen, the barriers and things God puts in our life. And God speaks through his word, but he speaks through pastors. He gives you a pastor. Amen. And, and, and he, he tells you, we, you don't need to go here. You don't need to go there. You don't need to do that. You need to stay away from that. You need to be careful. Praise God. And one, one elder said it like this. God doesn't care what you do. He cares why you want to do it. God doesn't care what you wear. He cares why you want to wear it. You know, I told some of the brethren the other day, you know, talking about different things. I said, you know, God, and I told the church this, he's not interested in our lighting shows. He's not interested in presentation. And there's a lot of things that I see that, I, that concerns me as a pastor, especially in our movement, because we can get caught up in the lighting show. And I don't think God steps back and says, man, did you see the lighting show at that youth conference? But that is, we're allowing religious, religiosity of the world to influence the church. The religious world, amen, they put on a good show. In fact, one church, you know, they had to cancel their worship because one of the smoke machines went out. The glory of God wasn't able to be in their presence. You know, and the smoke represents the glory of God. No, the glory of God does not need a smoke machine to let you know he's here. He inhabits the praises of his people, not the smoke machine. And so we, we twist things and we turn things and, and we, we try to, to uh, make them fit us. But you know what? We don't need to try to make God fit us. We need to try to fit God. I mean... We need to for, fit ourselves into his image. Respect who he is. Be more like him. Because I just have a feeling that if Jesus were to walk among us, he wouldn't be doing it in skinny jeans. <laughs> I'm going to lay all that stuff. That's just the truth. I don't believe he would. I don't believe Jesus would be walking around with a, a super tight t-shirt trying to teach the 5,000 with something on the front of it that says, you know, uh, greater is he that is in me. I don't feel like Jesus, uh, you know, he wasn't worried about, uh, you know, uh, being hip. Because this is why I understand. He was a Jew of the Jews. Because he understood the word better than all of them. 
He lived up not only to the letter of the law, he lived up to the spirit of the law. Because that's the difference. See, we were made in the image of God, but Jesus was made in the express image of God. So everything he was, that's who Jesus was. And Jesus did not just, amen, we, have to, we would live up to the letter of the law, but Jesus would live up to the spirit of the law. That's why he was constantly teaching about the spirit of the law. He'd say, you know, the law says this, but the spirit of the law says this. You know, the law says thou shalt not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you looked upon a woman to lust. Hello. Boy, it's, it's quiet tonight, but it's just teaching. It's Bible study. I've told the church, and uh, I, I, I've learned each service is geared with a different thing in mind. And so, our respect for him. And the reverence that we should show him should be lived in our everyday life. Amen. It's not how many times you come to church that makes you a Christian. It's not how many times you shout on a Sunday that makes you a Christian. It's not how many times you speak in tongues that make you a Christian. No matter how much of the Word of God you can quote, that doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is when you walk outside of this building and you are amongst unbelievers, they say, that is a Christian. Praise God. Now, I'm not trying to, to pat Brother Bumgarner on the back, but the biggest compliment I received is when I helped my little sister who is backslidden, not in church. Her and her husband are, are, are educators. And, and uh, you know, they went through a rough time, and I was there for them. I was never judgmental. I was there to help. I never preached at her that, you know what, if you had just lived for God, this would have never happened to you. I never did anything of that nature. I, I helped load her up. I helped move her. I helped encourage her. I told her I was praying for her. I'd tell her good things that were happening around our church, but I never tried to reprimand her for the decisions she made. And she told Sister Alba during the midst of that, she says, you know what, our brother's a real Christian. <laughs> now, I could have preached at her. I could have done a lot of things. But I have prayed for her, and I have tried to live an example in front of her that, hey, what we were taught as children was right. Because I can tell you this, amen, and I thank God for it, is that I was raised by Christians. Amen. And it was you do what's right, and you live right, and you live holy, not just at church, but at home. And we had times of growth, and we had times of struggle, and my mother, I'm, I'm sure every gray hair she has, comes from me, and a few from Nancy, but mostly from me. Amen, Sister Cynthia. Them sons, they just drive moms crazy. It's hard for mamas to tell sons no. I get so tickled when that boy of mine, and he's only six, but he knows how to lay on the butter. He'll snuggle up to his mama and it's like, what do you want, my little son? And daughters, they know how to work dads. They do. But you know, you got to be a Christian. And that's showing respect to the Lord, reverence to the Lord. 1 Peter 2 and 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Lay aside these things. There shouldn't be any malice or guile or hypocrisies or envies or evil speakings in the church. I shouldn't look at somebody and say ill against them because maybe they're being used in a different way than I am. You got to be careful of who you're judging. 
and, and I'll be honest, there's been folks that have said to me, I can't believe you're using so-and-so. Don't you know who that, what they do? Da, 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 da. Well, that's the truth. And I just smile, say, yep, yeah, I'm used to it. Because I know that we all have to grow. We've none of us obtained yet. None of us are as holy as we think we are. None of us is as spiritual as we think we are. And we all have to pray through on a daily basis. Now, one of the greatest sins that we commit is when we know to do good and we do opposite of that. Because he that knoweth to do good. So what is the greatest sin that a church member commits? Well, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't drink, I don't do all the things I used to do. And I know to do good and I don't do it. Well, you're just as bad as you was back then. Now, that's kind of heavy, though, isn't it? You have to know that I got to be doing good. Because when I don't do good, to me, it's a sin. When I, uh, when I uh, speak in envies or, or I speak evil of somebody else, that's gossip. You know, I have four, four, four criteria for being a member of the church. You know, pay your tithes. Be faithful to the house of God. Amen. Okay, we're thinking number three. I got them written down. But those two are very important. Be faithful to the house of God. Be faithful in your finances. But my fourth one. And the one I really want to talk about is, I don't like gossip. I don't like evil speaking. I don't like tellbearers. The Bible says you're an abomination for doing those kind of things. And we have to be careful because when we begin to speak, we're, we're showing a lack of respect to somebody when you start talking about somebody. And we, we have to be careful because the devil can use our own spirituality to cause us to be deceived. Now, 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 now hear me. He knows how to work us. He knows how to work the saint of God. And I, I'm just teaching tonight. I'm not trying to... Mr. Frank, he just went on vacation. and He sent me a text today with a picture. And... Uh, uh, he said, you'll enjoy this. He said, everybody in the church is spiritual but the pastor. <laughs> and we have to be careful of that. We have to be careful that we don't allow the enemy to get our minds twisted when we think, well, bless God, I've been praying and I know. I know better than pastor. That's a, that's a dangerous place to get in. Amen. That's a dangerous place to get in. And we have to be careful that when, we, when we're praying, we don't pray with a self-righteous spirit. Because that really voids your praying. Because the Lord doesn't work in the spirit of pride. He works in the spirit of humility. Isn't that what the Word of God says? That He resisteth the... But to the humble... He'll, he hears us when we pray. So we have to pray with that spirit of humility. And if you know somebody's not doing right, pray for them. But don't pray with the publican attitude. See, the pub, the, the, or the Pharisee, Pharisaical attitude, because the Pharisee, amen, he, he prayed with a proud spirit. Lord, thank you that I'm not like him. I got my Shondo and my Shania, whatever. Huh? That's what people think. 
A lot of people base their spiritual walk with the Lord based on if they talked in tongues or not. That is the evidence of the Holy Ghost. But, that let you know, hey, you got it. But the fruits of the Holy Ghost, we talk about the gifts of the Holy Ghost, but the fruits of the Spirit should be more evident in our life. Amen? Amen. So, the fruits of the Spirit are lived every day. The gifts of the Spirit are used in times of ministry. And yet so often we focus on the gifts only, but God wants you to have love and kindness and meekness and long-suffering and temperance. He wants these things to be manifested in us. And when we learn to respect Him for who He is, then we're not going to be so quick to talk about somebody else in the church. We're not going to be so quick to talk about the pastor. Now, y'all talk about me all you want. I don't care. He said, it's that newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted, the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built of a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So you're either going to build upon this rock, or it's going to be a rock of offense and a stumbling block to you. You've got to learn how to respect the Lord. Lord, you're head of my life. You're the chief cornerstone of my life. Now, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is not the author of confusion. But we know who is the author of confusion. Amen. And when the Lord speaks to us, He speaks very clearly to us. Amen. And if you have any questions about what God is speaking to you, come talk to your pastor. Amen. I may not have an answer, but I do know who has the answer. Amen. Praise God. Daniel didn't have the answer for King Nebuchadnezzar the first night, but he went to his prayer closet and came back with the answer. So if you'll give pastor an opportunity, I'll get the answer. Amen? But yet the enemy is able to uh, create confusion in your life. He's good at manipulating our spirits. He's good at putting fear and doubt and unbelief into our being. He's good at planting, amen, seeds of deception so that, amen, we no longer respect one another. We no longer respect the man of God and we no longer respect him. But he plans for us to be, verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 12, he says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now that's not dealing with church folks. But what does your co-workers think about you? What do people in the public think about you? One of the most, one of the saddest things that I've heard is when somebody that should be a part of the church was called dishonest. 
That's a sad day. Because we all are a witness. And we're a witness more by how we live than by what we say. I'm just letting that sink in for a minute. How I live my life. How approachable am I? Are you approachable? I promise you, if any of you need me, you call me. I've had people tell me, well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to come to your office. There's nothing evil in my office, folks. I bought two chairs that recline so we can both sit back and take a nap if we need to. <laughs> There's a coffee machine in there. If you want a cup of coffee or even a cappuccino, amen. I, I, ha I don't have any problem sitting down and having a cup of coffee. Sister D, don't shake your head like that. Brother David discovered my coffee. I get to actually, some men that are busy and they got families, they'll come in and we can sit over a cup of coffee and I get to really get to make con contact with them. But I, am not, I want you to know I'm approachable. If you have a need in your life, you say, well, it's, it was nothing, Pastor. It's something to you. It's something to you. And I care about the little things in your life. Now the thing that turns pastor off is when you want to come to the office and talk about everybody else in the church. I ain't got time for that. You don't have time for that. Now, now understand what I'm saying there. I don't want you to say, well, Brother Bumgarner said he don't want to hear my problem. No, it's not your problem. Your problem is, is you've got an issue that you need to get rid of in your spirit. Well, that, that's the problem. If you're having to come tell me about what's going on or somebody, there's something in your spirit that you need to clean out. Praise God. Now, if you feel like there's something in your spirit that you want to check, then come to pastor and check it with me. Brother Bumgarner, now I did this, but I want to check, check my spirit, pastor. Okay, check your spirit, and then I'll talk with you. Not judgmentally. We're all here to grow. Let the person in this place that has not lost their temper throw the first stone. Well, praise God. Let the person that's never yelled at their children throw the first stone. See, y'all can't throw a stone at me. Because we, we've all, at some point with our children, I've got three sons. Do you think I've never yelled? You're out of your... Mine, if you think I've never. <laughs> I've got teenage boys that do. I don't even remember being like that, but I guess I was. No doubt. And it starts with the other day. I had a three ring circus going in my in the boys' room because the biggest one, the two little ones, was trying to tackle the biggest one. And he was loving it because he was dominating them. I'm the big brother. You know, then they break something. Now, I know when you, somebody, when y'all's children break something in your house, y'all simply say, go to your room and think about it. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> what were you thinking? What was going on in your mind? Just go away from me. I'm I don't want to lose. I, just, I don't want to lose my Holy Ghost. Go away from me. Just leave. Now, I've been so upset at one of them, brother, brother Webb, that I said, "Now look, I'm very angry right now. You're going to get a spanking over this, but I can't do it right now. I'm too angry." It took me a couple of days. His daddy was angry, and there's nothing wrong with that church. I learned that from Bishop McLean. Once I started putting that into practice, it made a world of difference in my discipline. So I had to learn something. But you understand that we should all be approachable. 
We should all have time for one another. We should not look at each other and, and, and feel like we're superior. Come on now, that's just, this is just a getting back to basics of being, of being a Christian. It's treating people with respect and treating people right. You say, well, they don't treat me right. So be it. Then they're not being a Christian. Pray for them. But no matter what, how somebody treats me, I'm going to treat them right. No matter how, how bad somebody talks about me, I'm going to treat them right. And I've learned this, that when I live my life as a Christian, because before I'm a preacher, before I'm a pastor, I am a saint of God. I am a Christian. Because I'm not going to get to heaven. Well, no, I was a pastor, so you've got to let me in. That's like a free ticket. That's like the golden ticket in, right? No. No. You just did what I called you to do. But, well, wait a second. You know, I was a preacher, man. I, I preached all over the country, traveled for you. I did all these things for you. Don't they get me the silver ticket in? Nope. Because he doesn't say, well done, my good and faithful pastor, or well done, my good and faithful preacher or well done my good and faithful evangelist or well done my good and faithful sound room person or well done my good and faithful Sunday school teacher or well done my good and faithful usher or well done my good and faithful children's ministry director he don't say that he says well done my good and faithful servant and servants Has anybody ever worked in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a servant role for somebody? Brother Mike, you did? You as a waiter. That's a good example. Because as a waiter, people are set down, and you go up to them, you take their order, and they're constantly making demands. What'd you say? Come on. Sister Cynthia, I always like your play by. See, she said it. She won't tell me anymore. But you know, uh, sir, sir, I, I didn't want this water. Can you bring me a tea? Uh, sir, uh, we had a, you know, our appetizer's wrong. Uh, sir, can I get some ranch sauce? Sir, can, uh, uh, I wanted this medium well. It's well done, even though it's still pink in the middle. Um, can you take it back, sir? Sir, there's a fly in my soup. No, but they're constantly, you know, and I always try to respect them because if you've ever worked in that field, you, you know what they're going through. I'm sorry, I washed enough dishes in high school. I, I, I know exactly what a Hobart commercial washing machine is. I know what it is to take the sprayer from the sink and soak the floor so we could slide and have fun. So <laughs> I worked as a cook, and so I understood, amen, what it was to, to serve people and help those that were serving. But they, they make demands of you. And yet, as a servant, sometimes when somebody asks us to do something, how dare you ask me to do that? Someone said, Brother Bumgar, I'm called to preach. Well, what did Brother Palmer tell us? He told his pastor he's called to preach, and he said, well, good. Here's the toilet bowl brush, and here's the cleaner. You start taking care of the bathrooms. But wait, I'm called to preach. But what you find out a lot in ministry, it's not so much about uh, being able to tell everybody what you know. It's about being a servant. And that's why Jesus said that he would be chief among you. He would be servant of all. And believe me, as a pastor, you learn that lesson very quickly. Because this is servant leadership. And I don't have time to get into that. But servant leadership is, is such that even though I'm pastor, I'm still servant to every person in here. 
Brother Mark Foster said, one of his church members said, Brother Foster, boy, I wish I had a job like you. I could just go when I wanted to go, do what I wanted to do, you know, play golf, go fishing, just have all the time in the world. Not keep no time clock. He said, well, brother, you're right. I don't keep a time clock. But remember at 2 o'clock the other morning when little Susie was sick and you thought you were going to have to go to the hospital and you called me. I got out of bed and I rushed over and I prayed for little Susie and God touched her. He said, Pastor, say no more. But that's the truth. And I love what I do for the Lord. Now, I have to be honest. I love Peace Tabernacle. I'm very thankful to be pastor of this church. But my servitude, first and foremost, is to my king. I serve the Lord. And because I serve him, he's put me here. I serve you. That's the way I look at it. If you have need of something, I serve you. In fact, the other day, Brother Staines, he's not in here, Sister Leanne, they were moving. They called, and I was able to help. We went over, and we moved stuff. And, and uh, I told well, I'm going to go help Brother Staines move. And my wife says, oh, the glorious life of a pastor. <laughs> but I was thankful. I, I had the health to do it. I had the equipment to do it. And that's what you're supposed to do. That's what I was supposed to. Not because I'm pastor, Sister Leanne, but because I'm a brother in the Lord, and you needed my help. Praise God. We should do things not because we have to or because we have a position to, but because of I am a servant of the Lord and I should do these things. My brother should not have need of something if I can help them. My sister should not have need of something if I can help them. Praise God. And that's when we should truly show respect to one another and to the Lord. Because I, I, I say this and I mean this. If there's anything that I can ever do for anybody in this church. All you have to do is ask. Whether it's praying for somebody. Or helping you move something in your house. Or driving you somewhere. One of the funniest stories that Brother Fisher ever told me. Brother Myers. Because Brother Fisher was a great example. Of a great pastor. But when a man's wife. Won't drive him to the hospital. A good pastor gets out of bed. And goes over to the house. And loads him up in the car. And takes him to the hospital. Prays for him on the way while they're going. He was a great pastor. Still is a great pastor. And he and I talk regularly. But you know. He, 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 he and I were so much like that because it's about serving God first and serving people, whatever we can do. Amen? Amen? And when we respect each other in that way, we cannot help but have a great outpouring of the Spirit. Because on the day of Pentecost, they were in one mind and one accord. And when we respect each other, as servants one to another. The Bible says submit yourselves one to another. When we begin to respect each other and serve each other. And, and, and don't try to feel like we're superior to each other. And we just say man we're in this together. We're gonna, what can I do for you? And if you can do anything for me. You know whatever it is I'll do it. Just let me know. Amen. Praise God. Brother Wada he's out preaching tonight. But he stopped by the office. Pastor, I love you. If there's anything I can do for you, let me know, Pastor. And we'll just go do what you're doing. God's blessing you. You've, you've, you're growing up in the Lord, and, and you're being used. And I've got pastors calling me now saying, hey, I've got to go out of town. And I need a man I can trust. And it's so easy. And I'm so thankful. I can say, well, there's, there's somebody here that you can trust, and they will take care of your church. You don't have to worry about them. They're not going to say anything behind your back. Praise God. And I'm thankful that we have those kind of people in the church. He's not the only one. And just in case y'all were wondering where he was tonight. He's doing a work for the Lord. And so, I respect him and what God's calling him to do. In fact, I told him, I said, Brother Waddy, there's a great ministry in what you're doing. Because pastors, you know, it's hard for us to take off. It's hard for us to take off, especially on a Sunday. But I do know that if I don't take a break every once in a while, then I'll get burned out. I'll, you know, I'll just, 
And you don't need me burnt out. You need me fired up. So I say all that to say this. I said it's a ministry when you can go into another man's pulpit and know that you're taking care of his business, but he trusts you 100%. And folks, that's a wonderful thing. And you know, it's not about me building the kingdom unto myself. It's about building the kingdom of God. I believe in every ministry in this church. I believe every person in this church has a ministry. And I encourage you, seek with your whole heart, God, what are you calling me to do? What are you calling my family to do? And help us, Lord, to pursue that with all our heart. Because you have the blessing of your pastor. I respect you as men and women of God to do something great. Amen. The hour's too late. Let's stand to our feet tonight. I pray that you receive something tonight from the word of the Lord in this Bible study. Amen. I will tell you this Sunday morning, come believing. I, I feel like God has given me a word. And I've already, the message is already prepared. Now I am praying and fasting over it. Amen. But I'm going to tell you this. God's got a word for somebody Sunday morning. We're going to be baptizing. Amen. The sister uh, uh, come Sunday. Uh, what's her name? Julie. I knew it was Julie. All right. I was hesitant because I couldn't remember. But Julie's going to get baptized. That's another one being baptized in Jesus' name. So we, we're going to rejoice in that. But I really feel like the Lord gave me a word for somebody. Bring somebody with you Sunday morning. Amen. Lord Jesus. We thank you again, mighty God, for being so faithful. And I pray, God, that as the remaining part of this week, Lord, you'd be with us, go with our saints. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for this church family. Keep us and guide us, O oh Lord, in your grace, mercy, and truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Can the church say amen? amen. Praise God. God bless.